on tonight's program, one of her closest friends, one of our closest friends, and a close friend as well to this Writers' Institute where he has often been featured. Peck Boyers will introduce Lloyd Schwartz in a moment, but first I will offer just a few facts, and I mean facts. Lloyd is the Troy Professor at the University of Massachusetts in Boston and the winner of the Pulitzer Prize in Criticism for his work as music critic at the Boston Phoenix. He is the classical music critic for National Public Radio's Fresh Air and the author of three books of poems published by the University of Chicago Press, whose titles are Cairo Traffic, These People, and Goodnight Gracie. But those, as I say, are just the facts. I don't do facts, generally. As you know, uh, they're printed on sheets, but Lloyd's facts are not printed on sheets, so I, I gave you a few facts. Here, in any case, is Peg Boyers to fill them out and bring on Lloyd. Peg. Good evening. So, we may repeat a few facts here, but not too much. Uh, Lloyd Schwartz is a poet who specializes in a peculiar and distinctive music. Not surprising, since one of his several other specialties is music. But this is not the place to brag about his Pulitzer Prize in music criticism, or for that matter, about his authoritative Elizabeth Bishop editions or about his wonderful art and culture reviews delivered on NPR's Fresh Air. It's the poet, Lloyd Schwartz, that interests us tonight. You could say that his writing sounds offhanded and vernacular and downright funny, and thereby bring it into partial focus. Though to get it right, you have to add that his poems are often downright heartbreaking and formally very rigorous. Is he, as one admirer has written, a latter-day Whitman? The dust jackets of books on my own office shelves make the same claim for a whole variety of poets, <laughs> none of whom sound remotely like Lloyd, or Lloydy, as I like to call him. <laughs> Better to leave Whitman out of it and Marianne Moore, and other predecessor poets who allow us to praise our poets without identifying what makes them special. Yes, okay, Lloyd does have a compelling way of using the common language, as it is sometimes called. But no, he doesn't. He shouldn't call to mind the poetry of the Beats, for example, or the New York School. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> of course, in three remarkable, very no, <laughs> three times no. <laughs> it's okay, you can get it, not to worry. Of course, in three remarkable books of poems, Lloyd has developed a characteristic accent or flavor. He knows perfectly well how to write accomplished, modest, well-appointed lyric poems, like the lovely one called Leaves. No, not Leaves of Grass with lines that feature a subtle yet sonorous music. But the poems that most fully hold us in Lloyd's work are written in his more familiar, totally original idiom, an idiom consisting of what Richard Howard calls skittish devices and flagrant shards, an idiom, moreover, never slow or cranky. How skittish? Consider in Lloyd's work the way voices and counterpart or in plain conversation, often edge up to an insight only to turn away or back off. Consider the way a deeply felt emotion is invited, allowed in, opened up, while only a moment later it is denied or contradicted or submerged, almost as if it had not been expressed at all. In a poem called No Orpheus, a speaker cries, I'm lost. I'm like a stranger to myself, and I'm heading for nowhere. You 
moi. Je m'en accuse. <laughs> I have seen exceedingly in thought word indeed, and I apologize. <laughs> It's really funny. <laughs> Lord, forgive me. Anyway, it, it's kind of appropriate, right? It was kind of a poem, right? In your, right? Wasn't it? Who's on first? <laughs> anyway. Oh, but, okay. Consider the way a deeply felt emotion is invited, allowed in, or, or a sound even. Uh, opened up while only a moment later it is denied or contradicted or, or dinged <laughs> or submerged almost as if it had not been expressed at all <laughs> in a poem called Nor Orpheus or Telephone a speaker cries I'm lost I'm like a stranger to myself and I'm heading for nowhere but what follows subtly undercuts the emotion and disorients us with, I'm an unstationary pedestal, unquote, where the metaphor, the unstationary pedestal, is itself suddenly the primary object of our attention, and the raw emotion is, at least momentarily, deferred. He does this all the time, and it's really quite something. I, I teach a, in, in a workshop a, a long poem called Who's, Who's On First? And it's uh, based on, on um, this crazy jo joke, you know, um, uh, routine of Abbott and Costello's. And, but it's a, it's a love poem. And it's a crazy, painful, painful, painful poem about two lovers who are having a very difficult time. It's a completely original, wonderful poem that I recommend you Google immediately when we finish tonight. Um, in this regard, consider Lloyd's way with wit, the obvious delight he takes in foiling expectations, his love of one-liners and improbable jokes, his tendency to stick his genial finger in the eye of poetic decorums, as in the poem called Pornography, which is, no doubt about it, pornographic but features, in addition to obligatory buttocks and crotches and flashes of oh-so-welcoming flesh, a whole range of odd, possibly and unassimilable details, from the woman's mannish shoes to the impression of something sweet, humane, about them all, even in the midst of their clutchings and voluptuous spreadings and, you know, all the rest, the skittish in Lloyd is identifiable in his typically comings at things both straight on and sideways. The Schwartzian shards, so-called, are there before us when characters open up their mouths and speak in short breaths, anxious half-questions, unresolvable stabs of speculation. As readers, we are transfixed by the note of mild obsession or panic conveyed in bare and simple lines. We are held by the sense of the barely said and unsaid or unsayable. Never do we have any trouble with Lloyd's words. Taken one at a time, though the full intention in forming an utterance may well seem beyond us. Frank Bedart, reading Lloyd's poems, noted that it takes a great deal of art to appear so transparent and artless. Exactly. Lloyd gives us poems that sound often like the ordinary speech of ordinary men and women, but the harder we listen, the less possible it is for us to regard anything this poet writes as artless or as less than weird and compelling. It is my pleasure to introduce Lloyd Schwartz. <laughs> I'm trying to ding you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, one of the great things about coming to the Writers Institute 
are the introductions. <laughs> I even like the ones that aren't about me, but I have to say the ones that are, are about as good as introductions ever get. So thank you, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. I'm really sorry Jane couldn't be here, but I'm also not sorry. <laughs> I spoke to her. I know she's going to be fine. So, uh, I'm going to read mostly recent poems, so things that are not in a book. And uh, I will start. Um, I don't write a lot of poems about music, but this is one, and it's very new. The Conductor. Breezing easily between exotic chinoiserie and hometown hoedown, whisking lightly between woodwind delicacy and jazzy trombone, he must have the widest and oddest repertoire of gestures, which allows him a stylistic and dynamic range unusual even among today's most highly regarded conductors. The way he slipped from the grandiose opening adagio maestoso to the suddenly jaunty allegretto made me laugh out loud. Though his small, complex gesticulations can diminish and even undermine the passages where the melodic lines ought to soar. He's all dippy knees, flappy elbows, and floppy wrists. Not Bernstein's exaggerated self-immolation, but little complicated pantomimes. Steering a car down a winding road, patting down a mud pie, robbing eggs from a bird's nest and, and carrying them carefully away, flinging tinsel on a Christmas tree. As a baseball umpire, he could declare a runner simultaneously safe and out at home plate. <laughs> he threw himself into the music and very nearly into the first violin section with the kind of reckless abandon that comes only with complete confidence and authority. Not so much confidence in himself and authority over his players, but confidence in his players and authority over his material. These glittering performances, more dazzle than warmth, more brilliance than magic, sophistication, without innocence. Does the music ever hold surprises even for himself or terrors? How much would we love him if it did? In Flight begins with an epigraph the opening lines of the importance of being earnest. Did you hear what I was playing, Lane? I didn't think it polite to listen, sir. A big, hefty guy next to me, an even bigger guy already squeezed into the window seat. Big, pleasant fellows. Strangers before this three-hour, non-stop domestic flight. But they've been talking away non-stop since before takeoff. Talking business, talking sports. China, India, my next seat neighbor might have been from India. Talking Cubs and Red Sox, they both love them both. Google, the euro, leverage, banks, bailouts, masters of money, quote, it will change the way you think. Great deals and missed opportunities. Exxon, fracking, megabus, Amtrak, breakdowns, lost luggage and missed connections. A good place to stay in Detroit. Neither Cheez-Its 
nor Diet Cokes inhibit the juggernaut. <laughs> so much experience, so many theories, so much friendly advice, the urgent need to tell each other everything they know before the flight is over. <laughs> the Indian fellow occasionally bumping my left arm in his enthusiasm. Exactly, absolutely. All they've learned and thought, pouring out, pouring out, yet steering clear of delicate subjects. Politics, they know better than that. Or home, an hour into the flight, my wife has become ex-wife. No names. Nothing about movies or television. No mention of any other book, no music, but thoroughly tuned in to each other. Exactly, absolutely, handing over and taking in whatever they can in 195 minutes, like old friends, except not. As we begin our rough descent, a startling silence fills the cabin. One of them has drifted into sleep. Stretching to look out the window, I can make out farmland, roads, then tractors and cars. Some bumps and the sleeper awakes. But the conversation is over. Shutting down, touching down. Each of us left with our own thoughts of arrival or another departure. Then the busy powering up of phones, the clumsy lowering of overhead bags. Jamming the aisle, eager to get off and on with our lives. No handshakes, no goodbyes, but separated in the crowd and each with a little wave, they call out. Sam, Andy, um, this is a very new poem. I've never read it before, out loud. Um, I, probably you all have had the experience where you're walking down the street or sitting in a restaurant or just somewhere, theater lobby, I don't know. And someone says something absurd or strange and it feels like it's some kind of insight into the world, though it doesn't make any sense at all uh, necessarily. And this is, this poem is a kind of collection of these things that I've heard or overheard and arranged in some kind of like a vaudeville. Unexpected oracles. And there's an epigraph. What is the answer? In that case, what is the question? Gertrude Stein, July 27th, 1946. When I told him, he was like, oh my God, and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> After he dug her up and removed her jewelry, we found him cutting her up into little pieces. My dad works on the Constitution, you know, that boat. <laughs> How was Sweden? Adored it. They drove us everywhere. No umbrellas, no boots, no raincoats. When we got home, I said, dear, let's spend that Nobel money on our own limo. I couldn't imagine someone like Osama bin Laden understanding the joy of Hanukkah. <laughs> teaching, <laughs> teaching, 
Teaching history was like looking in a mirror and seeing nothing. Today, I felt so good, I tore up my dead to me list. At her age, she would have died anyway. <laughs> it's a luxury not knowing when you're going to die. I wish I had that luxury. <laughs> I define middle age as halfway between my age and death. <laughs> That's impossible. I haven't finished being seven yet. Do you have a good memory or a bad one? Yes. <laughs> he told me I was suffering from a mild radiculopathy. <laughs> if you need immediate assistance, press zero. <laughs> Nothing has ever happened to me in an elevator. <laughs> you were always afraid that a boy might go too far. I was afraid he wouldn't. If I had married that German count, I would have ended up a lampshade. So invite him. I'll dangle brisket. I don't mind shrimps, but clams, I can't look at them. Tea picking is very difficult work, isn't it? I put a <laughs> I put a thousand dollars in and still have a bad bottom. I love spending money as if I had any. The apple doesn't hang far from the tree. Every time I run into her, she treats me like a piranha. So if they give Pulitzers for criticism, how come grandma hasn't won one? <laughs> I'd like to thank her in absentia. All right, so thank you. Thank you, okay? Well, I don't give her attitude, and if I did, I wouldn't mean it. Just because you have a big prick doesn't mean you have to act like one. <laughs> Jesse, in his inimical way, didn't leave a forwarding address. <laughs> Don't explain it, for it doesn't make sense. Why you not be pleased I be translator of you? We're going to have some shootouts with the bad guys. I just hope we're the good guys. In his sleep, he said that the machine gun was in the back seat. For quality assurance purposes, your call may be monitored or recorded. Please don't be mad at me. I can listen while I'm talking. One builds one's own jail. We never regret. That's the beauty of our lives. If you have to go to church, you might as well sing in the choir. Which do they do first, the music or the dancing? Forgetting is one of the things I do best. My life is too full of unsaid things. Others have already written what I would like to write. I saw a great sculpture in London, gorgeous. It was hanging from a tree. The ambition of the artist to show the lie of the truth. The difference is often not great but it is crucial. Without art, people wouldn't be normal. 
living a normal life is a revolutionary act. An immaculate home is the sign of a wasted life. <laughs> it's astonishing and disheartening to know that things we love will no longer be remembered. Look, it's a real Van Meegeren. There's no bum like a pretty good artist. You should turn that into a poem. I'm not postmodern. I'm not afraid of Judy Garland. I'm too tired to hang up the phone. Well, I feel more like I do now than I did a while ago. <laughs> hey, that's something you can be fucking proud of your whole fucking miserable life. <laughs> do you believe in forgiveness? I believe only in forgiveness. Art is the arbitrary successfully posing as the inevitable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a sonnet. And I'll tell you the key to it afterwards. Is light enough? Who's there? I can't seem to make out anything or anyone. Is anyone there? Is that you? In this dim light that's not light, it's not light enough to see who's there. I've been waiting for you, asking myself when you were going to come or call. I don't like this uncertainty, this half-light, this state of bewilderment. Make it stop. Make it stop before I start crying. Now I'm shaking shivering. I want to steady my head against your chest. Where better to find peace? Wait, I hear your steps, the sound of your breath, your breathing, unmistakably yours even in the dark. Come closer. Find your way into the room. The wind always shuts the door so you don't have to. Closer. Sit down here near me. Tell me something. Answer me. Is the light enough? Should I tell you to open or pull down the shades? Uh, this poem was actually written um, as part of a challenge. Uh, and the challenge was to take a line of Gwendolyn Brooks and have each line in the poem that you wrote come at the end of that line. And I wanted to find a, poem, a, a line in Gwendolyn Brooks that was actually 14 words so I could write it. I could write a sonnet. It's kind of a love poem. And this is, an, this is another love poem. Crossword for David. You're doing a crossword. I'm working on a puzzle. Do you love me enough? What's the missing word? Do I love you enough? Where's the missing piece? Yesterday I was cross with you. You weren't paying enough attention. You were cross with me. I wasn't paying enough attention. Our words crossed. Where are the missing pieces? What are the missing words? Yet last night, we fit together like words in a crossword. Pieces of a puzzle. I have hmm, four more poems. Uh, this is a sad poem. To my oldest friend, 
whose silence is like a death. In today's paper, a story about our high school drama teacher evicted from his Carnegie Hall rooftop apartment made me ache to call you, the only person I know who'd still remember his talent, his good looks, his self-absorption. We laugh at what haven't we laughed, then not laugh, wondering what became of him. But I can't call because I don't know what became of you. After 60 years, with no explanation, you're suddenly not there, gone, phone disconnected. I was afraid you might be dead, but you're not dead. You've left, your landlord says. He has your new unlisted number, but insists on respecting your privacy. I located your oldest son, who refuses to tell me anything except that you're alive and not ill. Your ex-wife ignores my letters. What's happened? Are you in trouble? Something you've done? Something I've done? We used to tell each other everything. Our automatic reference points to childhood pranks, secret codes, and sexual experiments. How many decades since we started singing each other happy birthday every birthday? Your last uninhibited rendition is still on my voicemail. How often have we exchanged our mutual gratitude, the easy, unthinking kindnesses of long friendship? This mysterious silence isn't kind. It keeps me up at night, bewildered at some stage of grief. Would your actual death be easier to bear? I crave your laugh, your quirky takes, your latest comedy of errors. When one's friends hate each other, Pound wrote near the end of his life, how can there be peace in the world? We loved each other. Why, why, why am I dead to you? Our birthdays are looming. The older I get, the less and less I understand this world and the people in it. It's a poem about my mother. Little Kisses. My mother is mad at the sun. She hates the daylight. One more new day. In a nursing home, stuck in a wheelchair, she thinks she's been abandoned. In the background, a woman's nonstop wail. My mother can barely hear me on the phone. She doesn't know she's speaking to her son. I have to tell her she's speaking to her son. Oh, then I'm not alone. I have a son. Please don't forget that. How could I forget that? And you, who are you? Are we related? Of course. Are you my father? Don't you remember your father? Are you my brother? You're my mother. I'm your mother? Of course. Was I a good mother? You were, you are a wonderful mother. I'm glad you're my son. What's your name? You don't remember? I can't think of it. I'm all mixed up. Are we related? You're my mother. Did I ask you that before? Yes. Are you angry? Why should I be angry? Because I'm so stupid. What lovely flowers, the nurse says. Did your son bring them? Who? Your son, isn't this your son? He's my friend. 
I can't stop myself. Where is your son? Where's my son? What do you mean? Where is your son now? He's dead. Mrs. Schwartz, your son is on the phone. My son? Yes, say hello. Hello. Hello, how are you feeling? Much better, thank you. Why did you call? I call you every day. Forgive me, darling. I didn't remember. Well, hello. How did you know I was here? This is my son, isn't that right? You're my son, aren't you? You came out of my body. I'm your mother, isn't that right? Isn't he handsome, even if he has a beard? <laughs> I'm your mother. I'd love you no matter what you look like, wouldn't I? Give me a little kiss, will ya, huh? What are you gonna miss, will ya, huh? Gosh, oh gee, why do you refuse? I can't see what you're gonna lose. So give me a little kiss, will ya, huh? And I'll give it right back to you. See, I know all the words. I probably won't remember them tomorrow. So two more short poems. Uh, this one is a translation of a poem by a wonderful Brazilian poet uh, named Afonso Romano de Santana. It's called, in English, Getting Ready the House. My friend goes to visit his grave, like someone going to his country house to plant roses. Some time ago, he acquired this little homestead, planted trees around it, and occasionally he'll go there as if alive he could do what he would do only if he were dead. From time to time, he'll see his death beginning to blossom. He'll look around, think, straighten something or other out, then back to the business of life, making love, eating, inventing projects, having already left his death in the place it deserves. And the last poem is, um, is a sestina, but I think it's the world's shortest sestina. <laughs> Six words. Yes, no, maybe, sometimes, always, never. Never? Yes. Always? No. Sometimes? Maybe, maybe never sometimes. Yes, no always, always maybe. No, never yes. Sometimes, sometimes always yes. Maybe never. No, no, sometimes, never. Always? Maybe. <laughs> yes. Yes, no, maybe, sometimes, always, never. Howard and I will agree that that is a hard act to follow. Right? Yeah, yeah. You, you enter a new book by Howard Norman, and more or less at once, you find yourself enveloped in a strange and yet strangely familiar ether. You think of earlier books Howard has written, and you remark to yourself, this is different, very different. Though I'd know that accent anywhere, the imprimatur of a certain melancholy, a mingling of the tart and the sweet, 
the definite yet always puzzling intimation that what is most apt to be true is apt also to be largely or totally incomprehensible. Some of us, I count myself in that company, are not much drawn to the mysterious or the mystical, to that which always predictably surpasses understanding. Yet in Howard Norman's work, we feel that there is a freshness, a savor in the cloud of unknowing that seems never stale. There is no murk in Howard, nothing merely gray or impenetrable. As you go, you feel yourself at each turn in the narrative on the verge of some opening, some new prospect of a revelation that will not clear away the mystery, but will all the same make it seem a necessary aspect of our common experience. Not to know in Howard's world is a dignified aspect of our common condition. And why or how should this be? I hear you ask this and I want to answer. It's a mystery, or anyway, it surpasses my understanding. And yet answers to the why and the how are present in pretty much every page of Howard's writing. For one thing, you can feel the pleasure Howard himself takes in not knowing and in thereby having to remain alert to every least sign, every potential clue or inflection. He likes, you can feel this, invoking a Tibetan concept, accounting for intermediate stakes, likes conjuring encounters between the living and the dead, and refusing to demystify them or explain them away as delusions. And he likes, he loves to tempt us with the kinds of psychological analysis that looks like an account for anything without ever really explaining anything. Howard's newest novel is called Next Life Might Be Kinder. And it is, no doubt about it, describable as a book about loss and grief. But of course, there are many books about loss and grief. And it isn't possible to name all the ways in which this one is like no other. A passage from the book will help, maybe. Quote, I miss Elizabeth, a husband says to his therapist, sometimes to the point that all the oxygen in the world wouldn't be enough to let me breathe. I just stand there, choking. If you write that down, I'll kill you. <laughs> Elsewhere, the grieving husband reports to the therapist that he's become addicted to a television program in which other grieving persons use a so-called spiritual broker or middleman to make contact with their loved ones. And what do you get out of this program? The therapist asks, I get rage. The husband answers, rage. I share with you these tiny moments in Howard's novel, not to suggest that what distinguishes the accent of this book of mourning and melancholy is murderous rage, but to suggest that the novel is suffused from beginning to end by a complicated weight of emotions that Howard feels no wish to resolve or disentangle. So that rage and pity, tenderness and petulance, erotic mischief and contemplative elevation are completely interfused. To what end? Again, you ask. To the end cited by Chekhov in a letter that Howard quotes, quote, the only question, Chekhov writes, does the work as a whole allow one to taste the bitterness and sweetness of life, unquote. And the answer, as we think of Howard's book, yes, we say yes. The bitterness and the sweetness of life, that's Howard Norman. Howard.
Bye. It's very bad etiquette, I'm just going to say it. Uh, uh, for those of you that um, decided on prose and poetry instead of the uh, birth of our country tonight, um, it's nice that you're here. Um, I, I want to just say, besides you know, um, being endlessly grateful to Peg and Bob for inviting me back, uh, and Bob for his introduction, I, I always feel I should maybe have a giant gravestone carved, and that would be my epitaph, one of, one of Bob's, because it's, it's how you'd want to tr transport yourself into infinity, <laughs> thinking about it, because they're so thoughtful and, um, and uh, beautifully composed. I mean, they're just wonderful. Thank you, Bob, so much. Um, but I also want to just say one quick thing about Lloyd. Um, as, as you can hear, uh, for a prose writer to listen to how Lloyd, that the art of eavesdropping and then refining and ref, then refining what you've heard, is is just unprecedented. I mean, it's just just so wonderful. I learn a tremendous amount about composing sentences from uh, Lloyd's work. And so, Lloyd, that was a beautiful reading. Thank you so much. It's just great. Great. To meet you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I, and, and Bob spent a, a, a good deal of time, uh, and I'm grateful for that, talking about the novel that came out a, a month ago. But, you know, because this is um, the New York State Writers Institute, and you're all writers, and you all have works in progress, I thought I would read something new, and um, from a book that's done, but I, I think I have to go through it one more time. It's called 13 Crowded Hours. It's a, um, a book which, um, you'll hear begins with the near destruction of a Robert Kappa uh, photograph. Robert Kappa, the great war photographer, or great photographer who uh, is known for his war photographs, um, took a photograph that was published in Life magazine called Death on a Leipzig Balcony, and it is a, a depiction of a, shows an uh, American soldier being shot. But the actual complete triptych is much more of a narrative, and it was given to me as a gift. And, uh, and uh, it becomes a centerpiece of this whole novel. Um, and and, and, and w it, as you back away from the, the photograph and see the third part of this triptych, um, you see the head of, a, of an American soldier in, in Leipzig, Germany, and it, it, that guy's Canadian. And, um, and so I use that guy as the centerpiece. And, it, and the, the, the crux of this story, of this whole novel, is that a man whose father is in that photograph uh, he had thought it was his, uh, his actual father. It turns out not to be his actual father. And the book delineates all the things that happened to his mother and father on the day he was born, leading up to his birth. Um, and uh, I, I took the birth from uh, an account I read in a Halifax archive of a kid who was born in the Halifax Free Library. Um, how, how could that happen? Uh, his mother was the, the head librarian. And how did that end up? So um, there's a little bit of a, it's sponsored by a little bit of a reality, I guess you'd say. So I'm just going to read two chapters, not long ones. Interlocutrix is the female term for, um, you know, interrogator or somebody who's uh, probing. Um, so it begins with an auction. <clears throat> interlocutrix. The auction was held at 4 p.m. in the street-level drawing room of the Lord Nelson Hotel here in Halifax. Death on a Leipzig Balcony by Robert Kappa was the first item on the docket. The auctioneer had just said, taken on April 18, 1945, when my mother, Nora Ives, married name Nora Ives Rigolet, walked almost casually up the center aisle and flung an open jar of black ink at the photograph. I heard, no, it can't be you. But of course, it was my own voice already trying to refute the incident. My mother was tackled to the floor by the auctioneer's assistant. An octopus of ink sent tentacles down the glass. My mother was lifted roughly by two security guards to her feet and escorted from the room, and here, I thought she was safely tucked away 
interned in Nova Scotia Rest Hospital across the harbor in Dartmouth, room 340. I had been at the hotel to bid on Forest of Fontainebleau, 1863, a landscape by Eugene Cuvelier. Tenth photograph on the docket. Of course, I lost out on that because immediately I went to the police station on Gottingen Street. There, through the one-way window, I witnessed my mother's interrogation at the hands of my fiance, Martha Crochette. We get the Chronicle Herald in the common room, interlocutrix, my mother said to Martha. I saw Martha jot down a word on her legal pad. I assumed it was interlocutrix. Last week, Tuesday's edition, my mother said. Maybe it was Wednesdays. There was a notice of the auction, and right there I put my thinking cap on. My mother fit an invisible cap like screwing in a light bulb, and I decided it was best to leave during tea. You must understand that the hospital staff is always distracted during tea. I filched a little money from the attendance station, a little tin box they keep there, then I slipped right out of the food service door, free as a bird. Then what, Martha said. You made your way down to the wharf? I had on my good overcoat, my mother said, not to worry that I'd catch a cold. And of course, now you had pocket money for the ferry, Martha said. Yes, and once I arrived at Halifax side, I made my way to the Lord Nelson Hotel and sat down in the room where the auction was held. Have you been to the Lord Nelson Hotel? I have, yes. A very nice hotel, don't you agree? I just sat there, I sat there just as I pleased. Just like that. It was all quite exciting. I had my little jar of ink in my coat pocket from Arts and Crafts. Transcript to March 19th, 1977, the Halifax Regional Police. Nearly seven o'clock was when the interrogation ended. Before a police officer accompanied me, accompanied her on the return ferry to Dartmouth and finally back to Nova Scotia Rest Hospital, I watched my mother, still in the interrogation room, make a drawing of Halifax Harbor for Martha. She drew it on a napkin. My mother had been given cups of coffee and a scone to tide her over. She signed the drawing and in addition wrote, thank you for the warmest conversation I've had in possibly three years. Let's please stay in touch. I lived in the cottage out back of 112 Spring Garden, a big Victorian house owned by Mrs. Esther Hamelin, my employer. But I often slept at Martha's three-room apartment at 406 Cunard Street. And that's how I knew what my mother wrote on the napkin, because Martha had put it in a transparent evidence bag and stuck it to the door of her refrigerator with a magnet. Late on the night of the auction, I got up from Martha's bed, walked to the refrigerator to pour a glass of ice water. And there it was in plain sight. I studied my mother's drawing a moment. Its one seagull wasn't just the letter V floating in the sky. It had feathery definition and a keen eye. Clouds were filled in black, rain in the offing. In her depiction of a tugboat, I could make out the pilot in the wheelhouse, life preservers, mops, a fire axe, an accordion of hose behind glass, old tire fenders along under the rail. The drawing was altogether not too bad. I set the water glass on the bedside table and got under the bedclothes. Martha stretched her legs along mine and pressed against me. I couldn't get enough of you before, she said. She breathed gently at my ear for a full minute at least. Does your mouth hurt? Mine does. You don't realize you're kissing that hard until later. Maybe I'm feeling guilty. You know how I had to speak to your mother earlier then that's what I call putting your guilt to good use, I said. <laughs> I know it's my job, but after all, it was your very own mother I was questioning. I'm sorry you had to watch me do that. I didn't have to. I wanted to try and figure out what had happened, same as you. Besides, you weren't exactly putting the screws to her, Martha. No, but there's protocol and conniving strategies and psychological tricks of the trade they teach us. None of that I much mind when a person's a creep. I get mostly low-life creeps, as I've told you. But your mother, she seemed, I don't know, mainly she seemed disoriented, and I'd say kind of excited. Obviously a very intelligent woman, Nora. All those librarian awards and citations, she's read, what, 5,000 books? A very intelligent woman to talk with. 
Anyway, I said, you put her at ease. She was so shaky at first, and I hadn't seen her smoke a cigarette in ages. Well, you know, I'd like to have met your mother for the first time under different circumstances. <laughs> for God's sakes, I mean, you proposed marriage October 8th last year, exact same day you accepted. Strange, didn't you think how she kept calling me interlocutrix? I had to go and look that word up. I looked it up too, I said. I mean, technically speaking, you fit the definition, but it sounds so medieval torture chamber or something. <laughs> Interlocutrix, that's me. I'm confused. You know, she was doing so well. The hospital said no episodes for 11 months, and then that photograph set her off. I have no earthly idea why. You and me both. Say the glass got shattered. Say the photograph got splinters of glass. Say it was damaged for good. I'm talking thousands of dollars, maybe. Luckily, it's just ink on glass. Still in all, darling, a crime was committed, but factoring in that your mother's been living in hospital like she has, it's unlikely she'll go to jail. You'll have to face the music tomorrow with Mrs. Hamelin, right? Yeah, pretty much first thing in the morning, I'll go to the house. She won't have read about the incident in the papers until lunch, if it even makes the papers. You want me to go with, to Mrs. Hamelin's? Sweet of you, but no. I'm just going to tell her the truth and say why I lost out on the French photograph. How do you think she's going to take it? Esther, oh, probably she'll get in a foul mood. She suffers from a kind of acquisition fever, her words. Of course, in the past, I've come back empty-handed. Just because she's rich as Croesus doesn't mean I always get to outbid everyone. This one time in London, I bid higher than she instructed. It was reckless, way above what I was supposed to, and I still got trounced. Esther brooded for a month. I've noticed to me she's Esther, but to everyone else she's Mrs. Hamelin. What do you call her day to day? Mrs. Hamelin. But I'm always thinking Esther. Four years of working for her, I allow myself a private informality, right? If you want to give me a call after you speak with her, want to sleep? Definitely not, Martha said. I haven't shared this bed with you in four nights in a row this week. So now I'm going to read the auction itself, what actually happened. And this will, this will conclude the reading. The auction itself. The day of the auction, Mrs. Hamelin and I had lunch in her second floor library. Vichyssoise, a French baguette from Miller's Bakery on Trollope Street, cucumber salad, all prepared and set on the long table by Mrs. Brevetmore, whose position was referred to as the all-purpose who had a large, that's a Scots-Irish term that you hear up in Nova Scotia, who had a large sunny room on the first floor toward the back of the house overlooking the spacious manicured lawn and garden. When Mrs. Brevetmore left the library, Mrs. Hanlon ran her hand over the breadboard. See this inlaid Japanese lettering, she said? I'd like you to walk the breadboard over to Professor Tanaka's office at Dalhousie University and ask her to translate. She's an old friend. Probably it just says bread, I said. Still, exactly. I'd like to know what's written on my breadboard exactly. So that's how exacting Mrs. Hamelin could be. Mrs. Hamelin had turned 68 on March 1st. As she put it, I was born into money. It was from the fisheries. There were old family photographs in ornate frames along the hallway leading to the library. In one, her father, Petrus Hamelin, a tall, lean fellow with a handlebar mustache wearing fisherman's galoshes, stood on deck, a trawler. But you could tell that he himself was no fisherman, a little too top drawer, as Mrs. Brevetmore, Brevetmore would have it, a little too steam ironed and neatly folded. The fishing crew stood alongside and beside him holding gaffing hooks, and not one looked directly into the camera, though Mrs. Hamelin's father did. There were also photographs taken on each of her two wedding days. She married her first husband, Elaine Del Rowe, in 1938 in Mount Olive Holiness Church in Halifax. Elaine, she said, was a tree surgeon who died during...